In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Joshua, uh, specifically the uh, 24th chapter, and, and this is a really famous verse. When I read it, you're going to probably immediately recognize it. You're going to know where it comes from. And uh, I just wanted to make you aware of an aspect of it that I don't think we talk about as much as we should. But this week being an election week, this week being one where we are made more aware than we normally are of both our choices and the decisions that we make and the consequences of those choices, I thought going back to this verse, I don't know, it just felt appropriate. And because of that, I just decided to go with my gut and talk about this a little bit. And, and maybe part of it is also because Faulkner's lectureships, which, were, which went on this week, which, by the way, very difficult for me to do both Faulkner's lectures and have an election week on the same week, but so worth it. I mean, just phenomenal programs, phenomenal speakers going on all week here. Uh, very, very good lectureship. And, and if you got to attend some of the some of the sessions here, you know what I'm talking about. But it was primarily on the Old Testament and the way that Israel had this back and forth with God. That they were constantly trying to do a little better, and then they would wind up falling away and ignoring God, and then they'd call out for him to help him, and then he'd show up and help them, and they'd be back on top again, and then they'd get lazy and forget him again, and it was this vicious cycle that just kept going and kept going and kept going. And it's easy to look at that and be very aware of our human nature and very aware of that not really changing in the past, you know, two, three, four, five thousand years. And because of that and understanding that, say, is there really any hope for us? Are we just doomed to repeat this cycle for all of eternity? Or at least until the end of time when we go and, and enter into eternity? And to a degree, I think the answer is actually yes. But being distraught about that, I think, robs us, or at least is, being distraught about that is the product of us not having proper perspective here. So let's go ahead and look at our key text of the evening, John twenty four fifteen, where it says here, If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the God's uh, whether the gods which you your fathers served which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So at the end of this book, you have Joshua presenting them with a very clear choice. You have the opportunity to serve the gods which your fathers served, over there, when we were wandering around in the wilderness, in other words, the idols of the people over the Jordan River, or you could serve the ones that are here in the land that you're living now. And I think that that in some ways is a commentary on how Joshua sees himself in contrast to the rest of Israel, and that's the reason he's using this strong language. Joshua's been doing this for a very long time. He hasn't been the leader his whole life, but he has been right by Moses' side ever since the Exodus. And so he has watched these people constantly see wonder after wonder after wonder, be delivered by God, be given signs, be told to worship God, and then, you know, for a little while, being very faithful and then falling right back into idolatry. And they did it before they crossed the Jordan River. They... They did it after they crossed the Jordan River to take the promised land. It seemed to be a constant thing with Israel that idolatry was always a pet sin of theirs. Joshua was tired of it. And this is such a basic thing that he's looking at it and watching them and he's saying, look, you can serve the gods that your 
family did, that they were going off and serving other gods and other idols across the river. You can serve the gods that are here that you are uh, falling away from and serving now instead of the god that you're supposed to. Do what you want. My house is following God. And there's a couple lessons that we can draw from that. Like most choices, we can't make them for other people. When it comes to elections or really any other choice in our life, there are going to be people that make bad decisions. They're going to make choices that we're looking at a situation they're in and saying, how can you do that? It's obvious what the right choice is. Why won't you do that? But we have to be aware of the fact, and we have to really be content with the idea and make peace with the, the idea that we can't control them. Much as we w may want to help them, much as we may want to make a decision for them because we want what's best for them, ultimately, they got to make their own choices. And we can't control what other people do. We can control what we do. And we can control the places that we have influence over. If you're a dad and you're charged with being the head of your family, you can do that to the best of your capacity. If you're a mom, even if you have a husband that, that's not following God the way that he should, you can at least make sure that your kids are on the right path and that they hear the truth. If you're a kid, and, and this is a really difficult situation to be in, Maybe you can't control what your parents do, but you can at least control what you believe and what you do. Or maybe, maybe you're a guy like me that doesn't really have a family. Well, making sure that my household follows God is pretty simple. I just have to make sure that I'm following God. Simple. Didn't say easy. Said simple. <laughs> Sometimes I struggle with that one myself. I can barely keep track of what I'm doing. But ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Do the best you can with your sphere of influence. Now, Joshua is not saying ignore everybody else around you, just worry about the people in your house, because Joshua's been having this fight his whole life, and he's saying, ultimately, look, I can't make you follow God, I can't make you be faithful to Him, I can't make you believe in only Him and ignore these other idols, but what I can do is make sure that my house is right with God. And the second thing I think we can take from that is to tend your garden first. Tend your garden. What's the very first thing that Adam was told to do? Even before Eve entered into his life, he had a job. He had to tend the garden that God gave him. He had a responsibility to take care of the things that God gave him control over. And at that point, nobody else's spiritual well-being other than his was his to worry about. So all he had to do was the task that God gave him. And whether you're single or you've got, you know, a wife and 15 kids. The first thing you have to do is tend your garden, just like Joshua. Joshua knew that his garden was his primary responsibility. Doesn't mean he doesn't have a responsibility to Israel. He has a big responsibility to Israel. But he knew that making sure his garden was kept correctly first was the most important thing because if his house is going crazy and his kids are rebellious and worshiping idols and his wife is doing the same thing, how's he going to get Israel to listen to him? Why do you think in the Pauline epistles that one of the preconditions for an elder is that they have godly, faithful children? Even a single guy like me that, you know, would love to be an elder one day. If I don't get married and have kids, not in the cards for me. And you know what? That's okay. Because if you can't keep your own house in order, and if you've never managed that and dealt with that, how can you be expected to lead other people to do the same? This is something that is a continuing thing through the Bible. By the way, this is something Joshua had firsthand experience in. Because you remember the story of Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's rebellious sons that ignored God's precepts and didn't obey him and wound up getting consumed by fire from heaven because they refused to obey and treat with reverence God's worship? He knew what that was like. And he knew that Aaron, and I don't know if it was really Aaron's fault or not, I, I tend to think he bore at least some responsibility. He didn't make sure that he and his house were following the world and uh, following the Lord and following it with their whole heart. And because of that, it tore his family a new one. I mean, it didn't destroy his family, but it certainly had to be a horrible thing to have to view and witness 
and then have to live with the fallout of that afterward, and Joshua doesn't want that to happen to his house, and so he decides to do something different than what Aaron did and make sure that his house is on the right path. And then the third lesson I think we can take from that is do not let your surroundings drag you down. Joshua understood, and probably felt like, based on the language of this verse, that he was the only person that had this mentality. That he was the only one that was like, we've got to follow the Lord and only the Lord, and we're going to follow his commandments, follow his precepts. Which, by the way, the first one is that I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, that's like the introduction. And the children of Israel couldn't even get that right. Now, I'm not saying don't be influenced by outside sources. Having a group of Christian friends, Christian family around you to support you, that understand what you're going through, that, that try to propel you forward, please be influenced by those people. That's part of the design of the church and the reason that God put it into place. So I'm not saying don't ever be influenced by anyone from the outside. I'm saying if there are people outside that are not doing what they're supposed to, do not allow those people to change what you are doing. Because Joshua is saying, you know what, every single other family in Israel, they can go out, they can serve idols. I don't want them to. I've warned them not to. I've, I've told them that they are going to hurt themselves if they continue to do this. But you know what? Even if all of that happens, even if every single other family is unfaithful to God, my house will be. And if that means that God winds up destroying Israel, that they wind up being taken over by someone, which, by the way, eventually did happen because of idolatry. Even if the whole world comes crashing down around me and everybody else is living in sin and debauchery, my house follows God. End of discussion. It's actually the same mentality that Noah had. I mean, literally the entire rest of the world was unrighteous, but his three sons were saved. His wife was saved. He made sure that his house was in order, and Joshua was, Joshua was determined to do the same. And before I leave you for this week, this is the thought that I really want to stick in your head. Because all those things are really important. All those three lessons that we just talked about, super important. I want you to take those home and chew on them for a little bit. But at the end of them, I want you to remember this. He didn't say choose. He said, choose today, or as the King James puts it, and I just, I like this because I cut my teeth on the King James and I remember it better. Choose ye this day. In other words, this is not a decision that you get to make later. This is not something to kick the can down the road and decide maybe at some point when you get around to it. Choose now, right now, and live with the consequences of your decision. You know, there's a great C.S. Lewis quote where he talks about there's so many men that, that want to be that will pray for righteousness, but what they really mean is, God make me righteous tomorrow. God help me eradicate the sin from my life tomorrow. Let me, you know, sow my wild oats and, and do what I want to, and then at some point I'll get around to following you, and then they wind up dying and they've never done it. You see, God is too important and deserves better then, well, I'm going to do what I want for a little while, and then I'll get around to following God. Now, that, that's not how this works. You choose today what you're going to do. You choose today whether you are going to follow God or follow the world. Joshua had his mind made up. And I hope you'll make your mind up too, and I hope that you'll come to the same decision that Joshua did. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, Woke Brigade.